Hi, everybody. Welcome to the first webinar of our Supporting Father Involvement and Co-Parenting webinar series. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Joshua Sparrow, and I'm Executive Director at the Brazelton Touchpoint Center, where you can find more virtual learning opportunities in our webinar series on family engagement, mental health in the times of COVID-19, and also about how to deliver your services to families online and many other uh, online learning opportunities. Just go to our website, browsefromtouchpoints.org, and click on the webinars tab. We have over 2,700 people registered for today's webinar, and we're so thrilled to have you join us today. Thank you, and thanks also to the Supporting Father, Strengthening Father Involvement Program for collaborating with us on this webinar series. We really hope you'll enjoy today's webinar and that you'll come back for the rest of these series. Before we start, though, here are a few housekeeping details. If you are having difficulty viewing the webinar, you can also watch it live on our Facebook page. So if that's the case, just go to the Browson Touchpoint Center in Facebook. Then the live stream video of the webinar will be pinned to the top of our page. Today's webinar is providing live Spanish translation as will the other webinars in this special series. So to access it, just click on the interpretation icon in your Zoom controls at the bottom of your screen, then select Spanish. <clears throat> and to mute the English in the background, select mute original audio. La conversación de hoy será en español e inglés. En los controles de su reunión, haga clic en inter interpretación. Haga clic en el idioma que le gustaría escuchar. Para escuchar solo el español, haga clic en silenciar audio original. Today's webinar includes a chat box. And all of you, uh, looks like many of you already found it and you're telling us where you come from. It looks like you come from all over the country and some from other countries as well. Welcome. So there's a chat box and there's a Q&A box. Please use the chat feature if you have a comment or technical technical issue to share. If you have a specific question for the presenters, though, please uh, try to remember to put that into the Q&A box. We'll be looking at both and we'll try to, um, to respond as best we can to all of you. Also, I'd like to let you know now that we invite you all to stay if you can beyond the end of this hour for more questions and answers and for some extra videos of real fathers talking about their experiences with the Strengthening Father Involvement Program. Later today, you'll receive from us a thank you email with a link to a recording of today's webinar and a link to our feedback survey. So I hope you'll complete the survey. It will help us um, do better on future webinars and know what worked and what didn't work for you. And if you'd like a certificate of attendance for today's webinar, you'll have to complete that survey. So, so watch your email inboxes for that. If you have technical problems during the webinar, please email Kayla Savelli. You'll find her email address posted in the chat. We'll try to put that in there several times since there are so many of you um, saying hello to us and to everybody there right now. So now let's find out who's here. And we had a poll for you. And it looks like um, we have 33 people uh, who've joined us from Child Welfare, 389 folks who've told us that uh, you all are from Early Childhood Education, 132 in Early Intervention, 352 in Family Support, 24 in Healthcare, 61 in Mental Health, and um, 65 others. And that's out of what looks like about 1300 people who are with us right now. So welcome to you all. So glad we have you all with us and from uh, so many different sectors. This part of our mission at the Browson Dutch Point Center is to work towards a, a common language that brings us all together and creates a consistent and seamless experience for families. And that includes fathers. So now let me tell you a little bit about who our presenters are for today. And I'll start with Armando Alcaraz, who has worked as a social worker and facilitator in uh, Latino and Hispanic communities with parents in uh, households that are low income and with parents of children with special needs for more than 15 years. Currently, he's project director at Papas of the Central Coast, a program of Encompass Community Services 
that offers parent groups and social activities in California, Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. And these are designed to strengthen father-child bonds. Unfortunately, Sean D. Johnson won't be able to join us, but I wanted to tell you just a little bit about who will be missing today. Uh, Sean D. is a fatherhood advocate with firsthand knowledge about balancing paternal and professional responsibilities. With over 15 years of experience in managing human service programs, he's helped community agencies understand the importance of engaging fathers. He served as program manager for Dads Matter through the Children's Bureau of Southern California, and they've used the Supporting Father Involvement Program, the Strengthening Father Involvement Program, as its core curriculum for fatherhood services. Also with us is uh, Dr. Kyle Pruitt. He's clinical professor of child psychiatry and nursing and has served as director of medical studies at the Yale School of Medicine's Child Study Center. With his wife, Marsha Klein Pruitt, and with Drs. Carolyn and Phil Cowan, he served as co-investigator in the award-winning eight-year 900 plus family multi-site multicultural abuse and neglect <coughs> prevention study supporting fatherhood involvement for California's Office of Child Abuse Prevention. And uh, finally, Dr. Marsha Klein Pruitt is the Maconda Brown O'Connor Professor at Smith College School for Social Work. She has over 25 years of clinical experience with expertise in couples counseling, father involvement, and co-parenting consultation, as well as the design and evaluation of model programs created to minimize family conflict and help solve disputes within and outside of the legal system. She's one of the four designers and consultants of the Supporting Fatherhood Involvement Program, which we'll hear all about today and in the upcoming webinars. And she's also been involved in its design and implementation in the United States, Canada, and its current adaptations in other countries abroad. You can learn more about today's presenters at our website, brasswoodsandtouchpoints.org. So let's um, now turn to um, you, doctors and Dr. Pruitt. Thank you, Josh. Um, we are delighted to be with you today. Thank you to Touchpoints for the opportunity to work with this wonderful audience <clears throat> and to talk about a program which has enlightened us and the field um, in, in the direction of encouraging paternal engagement in places where it is not typical. Um, we have, um, we want to start with where the seed came from and it came from California. It was planted by the Office of Child Abuse uh, Prevention. <clears throat> they turned to the four of us almost simultaneously, not knowing that we had a lot of personal connections with each other because they've been, been pretty up unhappy with their past research funding efforts to which had focused primarily on well-researched mother-child interventions that were a little less effective with some of the more complex families that they worked with. So they asked us to design a clinical research intervention to increase OCAP's efficiency um, and to take the focus away from simply focusing on the mother-child dyad into something that looked a little bit more like this. We could look at the next slide. Before you do, can I just add that although it's supporting father involvement, um, and we had originally tested this with <coughs> any father figures <coughs> and with a female figure, um, this program also has been implemented with same-sex couples and um, particularly two dads, but also two moms, and um, also has shown to be effective and, and of great interest to people. So I just want to mention that for all of you. Marcia and I were interested in this topic, not because we were father advocates, but because we've both been working with challenged families for a very long time, and noticed the marginalizations of, of men and fathers and partners, sometimes same-sex partners. <clears throat> from the healthcare, from the education institutions. So I want to turn right away to Armando and ask Armando why he is, got interested in SFI. Um, we call it supportive father involvement. Josh prefers to call it strengthening father involvement, which I love. Maybe that would have been a better title. <laughs> Armando, why you? Yeah, thank you. Well, first, first and foremost, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and, and just share from my perspective um, my experiences and uh, 
And yeah, I first was, was uh, th the way I came to SFI was uh, I had been working for many years with families, uh, uh, with, with families with special needs children. Um, and, and also on my own, I was just kind of doing a lot of work on, on communication uh, to help families have better communication. And, and through that part of my work, I, I uh, connected with uh, uh, my predecessor in, in a direct, the director of APAS who worked also with, with, with Marsha and with Kyle. Uh, Duchon, who kind of he kind of introduced me to SFI, and what really caught my attention was was this uh, this way of, of working with the whole family, uh, but that that kind of opened the involvement of the fathers first, which were you know what I noticed when I would work with families in the community uh, in in my communication work that I was doing. Um, most of the attendees were female, and 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 the attendees that were with uh, with families, they tended to be mothers, um, and so it was kind of and I, I would see it over and over again that it was just kind of harder to involve fathers in uh, in in social services and and I just saw this as something that was very different and very unique in the community at the time, so it Thank really you. piqued my interest. Thank you, Armando. It's helpful to hear what it's like at the street level. Josh? Yeah. I think we are going to go to the next slide because we have a question for you. We, um, we know you probably wouldn't be here if working with um, fathers didn't matter to you, but we really would like to hear from you um, why working with, father, with fathers does matter to you. So um, if you all, um, <laughs> 1,600 of you would just um, put in a few words into the chat and tell us um, why uh, working with fathers matters to you. We'll try to pick out a couple of your comments to share. <coughs> fathers are undervalued. Family stability for the children, better outcomes for children. They tend to be overlooked. And I think we were also going to talk about how uh, there tend to be um, unrealistically low expectations of fathers. I think we'll probably come back to that. Wow, um, <laughs> they're going so fast. Negative stereotypes. Fathers play an important role in children's development. They bring unique perspectives. Because, <laughs> going too fast for me, lots of you bring unique perspectives, important in a child's life, supporting fathers to support the family. There's something about decolonizing. I want to see that one. <laughs> Postpartum in men. <clears throat> decolonizing toxic masculinity in macho roles cultural need in indigenous homes, wow. Um, supporting families during their child's early intervention process. We've got a lot of uh, folks doing early intervention here. Support the whole family, especially if fathers want to be involved. To help parents to learn how to co-parent and the importance of fathers. I'm very interested in the research behind the impact of involved fathers, and we'll hear a little bit about that today. And I have the great um, good fortune of doing a, a webinar with uh, Kyle Pruitt uh, back, I think, um, about a year ago. And it is on our website at browsers.org in the Learning to Listen series. So um, Kyle uh, also uh, talked at uh, length there about the research behind the impact of involved fathers. More responses. They are crucial to young children's optimal early life experiences and development. My first time working with a father who has rolled their child into childcare, and I was able to value this father's experience in early childhood. Mother's caregiving will not be adequately valued until fathers are included equally as caregivers. 
It's interesting. Yeah, and Kyle's nodding. So I maybe I should stop there and let you all, Kyle, Marsha, Armando, um, you've you've heard me read some of these many responses. You've read some others. Tell us what you're thinking as you see these. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> we look forward to actually addressing a number of those issues today. Um, but we want to give a little quick peek. Um, sort of we would not a spoiler alert, but you are actually here going to hear directly from some fathers in one of the videos that we may have a chance to show you, or maybe it'll, you'll, we'll have to uh, do it a little bit after our time is done and we can do it in the, after, in the afterglow. But um, these men sound a lot like some of the people who just chatted that the valuation of the paternal experience, the sense that they're on the margins. Um, but, you know, if you bring them in, what happens to child outcomes? We're going to get around to much of that stuff and we look forward to that conversation. Let's start with the next slide. <clears throat> Supporting father involvement had um, some very specific purposes. It was not all over the place. It was to strengthen the positive involvement, not just all involvement, <laughs> but the positive involvement of fathers with young children and their mothers and their partners. To reduce the abuse and neglect uh, risk in these families and to improve child and family outcomes. We wanted to see if you made homes safer by engaging men, you could also improve the lives of children long after the intervention. And that's where most of us, that's where most of our heart lies. We wanted to test ways to increase father friendliness, father engagement, father inclusion among practitioners, um, practitioners that are just like the ones that are attending this webinar, among the local and county and state agency and policymakers and programs as well. We weren't just talking about the practitioners. We wanted the governor's staff to be thinking differently about early intervention. Next slide, please. And early intervention is where most of us are. And I just wanted to remind you um, something that we all treat as gospel, but it is not widely embraced and we need to keep talking about it whenever we get any audience. And that has to do with the enormous bang for your buck when you intervene early in the life of a family and a child. Down the left side, the brain's ability to change in response to experiences starts at the very top on that vertical axis. And then it slopes downward and we stop at 70 where uh, most of us um, are having a hard time remembering where our keys are and our brains are no longer really absorbing much. At the bottom of the left axis, of the left vertical axis, the amount of effort that it takes for such change to occur. It's near the bottom. It's practically effortless to intervene early when you're doing the right things. And the effort increases, increases, and goes up, as does the expense, as the, the likelihood that it will not be effective. So I know I'm preaching to the choir, but remember the tune, <laughs> early intervention, early intervention. We can't be the only people that believe in this. So SFI was set up with the idea that the youngest family member, in order to get into the study, had to be two years old. I have to say, as the former president of zero to three, I lost the argument for infancy, but I settled for two. Next slide, please. It's a holistic entire family approach. Um, it, was, it was very bold um, because the science is of such a high standard. This is not a question you want poorly studied uh, because there are an awful lot of ideas are out there about paternal engagement, whether it was good, whether it led to, as one of my teachers told me, you're just gonna find maternal deprivation. Um, the intervention, the first randomized controlled clinical trial, and those of you who've been part of those, knows that those are not for the faint-hearted. Father infant involvement, father partner involvement in families with low incomes from diverse cultural backgrounds, including Latinx, Black, Native, White, Caucasian. Uh, we went for the families that California wanted us to serve and study, not ones that we were sure would positively uh, engage with the program. Next slide, please. Marcia. The curriculum that we developed is based on a validated model of risks and outcomes. That is, we scoured the literature on what is likely to reduce 
child abuse and domestic violence and promote family well-being and resilient contexts. And we had five domains and our curriculum and assessments each focused on those five domains, which we'll share with you in the next slide. So the first one is parents as individuals. Got to start where we all are, which is with us. And we were interested in helping parents increase their ability to, to cope. And we looked at things like depression, anxiety, um, concerns about work. Uh, those are the main three, but then we, and self-esteem. But then we were also interested in the couple's relationship. So how do you increase collaborative problem solving among a couple? How do you increase their communication generally and decrease conflict? Conflict is known to be one of the most potent and problematic um, factors for children's development. Children as young as just um, a few months can tell when parents are fighting and they respond. We then also looked at parent-child relationships. We wanted to increase posit positive father involvement, as Kyle mentioned, and also to help parents with age-appropriate parenting strategies. One that often gets left out of curriculum and that we think is probably one of the bedrock factors is family of origin relationships. The kinds of things we learn about parenting and about family life came from our own families. It came from what we got and it came from what we didn't get. And it came from what we wish we got. And so we look at those cycles of harsh treatment, abuse, um, avoidance over three generations so that families can begin to look at their patterns and see where they're coming from and how they can begin to change them. And finally, we looked at the balance between stress and social support. We couldn't reduce all the stressors in people's lives, but we could increase their use of support from family, from friends, and from social services, and to see how better this could help people respond to things like work and family stress. Kyle, you want to continue? Next, Next slide, please. This is your, your, this is still your. Okay, I'll keep going. So how do you reduce, reduce the risks for child abuse and neglect? Well, the first thing is, if we could reduce parents' distress, their anxiety and their depression and their reactivity and foster their well-being individually, but also to work together as a couple and co-parents. When one of us is stressed, the other steps in, whether we're living together or not, whether we're a romantic couple or not, it's very helpful to have someone that you can hand over the kit to and say, I need a little time, I need a break. To encourage strong relationships with parents and children, we know that a strong relationship with dads is a protective factor for child abuse that, from moms. To help parents understand where their own values and behaviors come from, what they want to change, and how they can change it. And also to help them use support more effectively when they do feel stressed. Who do you reach out to? How do you get the help that you need so that you can lower that the stress level, you can lower the temperature in the family so that everybody kind of takes a breath and before everything erupts, people start coping and getting distance and managing a bit better. Next slide. So there's different kinds of parenting groups. Some are more like group therapy. Some are very much like didactic classes. One of the things that we emphasize here is that we are not experts. Parents are the experts on their own family. What they need is some ideas about how to talk to each other and work together and work for the betterment of their family. So we begin each class with an open check-in. We stay focused on the topics of the curriculum which follow those five domains. Leaders are not interpreters or therapists. They're not presenters. They're guides, and the goal is to help families figure out what they want to change. It is therapeutic, but it is not psychotherapy. It's also more than psychoeducation, which we know works to some degree and for some amount of time, but not as deeply as when you really start to change people's internal, internal structures. So now you've seen um, what it is, what it is not, I think we'd like to hear from Armando about 
some of the favorite families they worked with and some of the more memorable um, experiences they had pro providing this program in their communities. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've seen a lot of uh, different, uh, you know, different families come through our program. And uh, I mean, through the through the years that I've been involved in the program and also as a, as a director, um, uh, one of the things that I, that I first in general, one of the things, one of the feedback uh, that we get from uh, the, the, the fathers that come through the program is that, um, and let me just kind of go back a little bit and just kind of explain that the population that Papas uh, works with uh, my particular program, uh, we have a lot of uh, fathers that come from uh, residential rehabilitation of, of substance abuse um, and uh, that are some of them come because of the different partnerships that we work with. Uh, we, we have a good amount of population that comes from there. And one of the feedback that that we get from there is that, you know, is it really a program that they feel there's there are people that have come through many other programs before and one of the differences that they find is that they really feel uh, that it, it's kind of like a program that, that helps them think about becoming a better person rather than, um, uh, rather than you know, puni punishing uh, for not doing this or not doing that. Like a, it, it's more, you know, it has a more positive uh, tone in the whole program. And I think that comes from this approach that you were talking about that it's not like a group therapy, not a didactic class. It's a discussion where everybody's sharing with each other what they're what they are about, um, and we've seen a lot of transformations. I mean, uh, one thing I, I was also looking in the in the in the questions they're talking about uh, younger uh, teen teen parents. Um, there was one particular teen uh, that we worked with that was I mean he was I, I believe he was 17, 18. Uh, and when he came, he was, he, you know, he was pretty much locked. He had a, he had a child and, uh, and <clears throat> the, the family of the mother just wouldn't, they, they distrusted him a lot. And he was kind of blocked out of uh, being able to be part of his child's life. And through the program, we realized how much he was fearing acting, uh, taking, following the footsteps of his own father. Um, and that was uh, very powerful to see his change in that level when he realized he could have his own his own path in fatherhood, um, uh, and it was very moving for me. And at the end, he was able to be involved in his da daughter's life. Uh, he became, you know, he he was sharing fifty percent the custody, and and could understand in a more global way that it was about improving relationships. Uh, so he improved relationship. He really worked on improving relationship, not only with the co-parent, uh, but also with his his uh, in-laws. Uh, that that was part of the issue that were so distrustful of him being involved. So, and a lot of that's those sort of stories uh, are repeated over and over again, where they when where the participants really see, oh, it's about relationships, and it's about how can by improving those relationships, it improves. Uh, the whole family, um, the whole family is, imp is improved, and the the impact is seen on the ch on the children. Thank you. Next next slide. We'll be back to you in a minute, Armando. So, what does this intervention look like? Um, it begins with individual and couple interviews. This is where we screen for safety for the couple to be in this intervention together. This is where we actually learn about the couple and what their concerns are. And they learn who the group leaders are and what's going to come and how, what it's going to feel like. We found that it's been very successful in engaging men who don't want to come to a group not knowing what it's going to be like. Then the groups typically are two hours for 16 weeks. Um, everybody, when we designed this, said nobody would come for 16 weeks, especially the low-income families that we were working with who had complicated work schedules or um, 
difficulty working together and getting there. But our experience has been that most groups actually ask for more after the 16 weeks. Sometimes there's a, a shift in the way this is done. We always keep the 32 hours, although it may not be over 16 weeks. Both parents are welcomed in the first session. We used to have one cup, we do couples groups and we do men's only groups. When we did the men's only groups, we found that the men didn't come as often or stay as much as if we had the partner come for the first 15 minutes of the first session. When she knew what was happening and what was gonna be talked about, and she gave it her blessing, he began to come more often. There are two different activities, um, two different sessions where the mothers and fathers are in separate rooms and the mothers are talking about what's changing and how they can be more helpful and where they're gatekeeping. And the fathers are, we bring in the youngest child and the fathers do activities with the children. There is a case manager in the room who also supports that, gives them ideas, helps guide them. So we do that twice. In each session, there's a little bit of structured discussion. There's questions asked and people talking, but there's also games played, activities. Everything's very hands-on. Um, a lot of the people who have participated in our programs, both with our First Nations groups, um, with all of our different groups across really parts of the world now, many parents are not readers. And so they, we have things that they can read, but everything's also um, designed so that nobody has to read. And for many activities, we give choices. The idea is to get to a goal, it's to get to a, um, a focus or a topic, but how we get there is less important. And we know that when we incorporate fun, we also get intense and serious discussions. So Josh, were we gonna pause for a question? Yeah, we've got um, a number of really great questions. I'm having trouble making my mind, but um, let's try uh, one first that I think will um, allow you to clarify. This one was, uh, you offer this class to women. Do you equally offer motherhood classes to men? Are you concerned, this is all the same question, are you concerned that the presence of females in a fatherhood class will cause the men to close up and not share their true feelings out of a fear of being judged? So first of all, we wondered if that would happen. It hasn't happened at all. No, the, the partners come together in our couples groups. So we have two different um, models. One is when the fathers come and that one is typically for um, men who don't have involved and engaged partners where they are not as involved and engaged with their children. Often they've been in prison or they've been um, removed from the family in some way through child welfare and they're trying to take some skill building but also some rethinking in order to move their way back into the family. Some of our <coughs> groups have even decided to do the dads only and then to do the same groups with dads and moms together. But by and large, most groups have said they prefer to do partners groups. And while the father's groups tend to get rowdier faster and the laughter's a little louder, the mother's groups actually go deeper. And we have done research that shows that both groups are very successful at making change at the individual and the parenting level and for children. But only the partners coming together makes real change in the couple relationship. And that's why, Josh, we don't call it mothering or fathering. We call it parenting. And we do focus on the, um, some of the cultural and interesting differences between what we do with our children as mothers and what we do with our children as fathers. But it is the joint appreciation and respect for those differences that is highlighted in co-parenting work that removes the opportunity for shame. So there, there were um, several questions about domestic violence. Um, we will come back to more questions after we formally end for everybody who can stay, because there's a bunch of specific questions about how you actually do this and who can do this that we'll hold on to for then. But I just wanted to address um, 
ask you to address some of these questions about domestic violence because there are a number of them. One is, how do we support families who have difficulty co-parenting due to a domestic violence history? And how do we then engage those fathers who culturally believe that the emotional being of their children is the work of mothers? Uh, another is, um, what is the step when um, it's domestic violence related? Are you still able to work with parents and what does that look like? What if parents are not safe together, restraining orders, et cetera, can they do the intervention separately? All good questions. So we're very careful about assessing for domestic violence and domestic violence has many tones to it. Both mothers and fathers engage in domestic violence. Often it is mutual in a family, but there's also levels of fear. There's levels of recency. There's level of severity. All of that gets assessed. And then if the couple is safe in the groups together, we have found that they choose to be in the groups and that it in fact does bring down the harsh parenting and some of the other risk factors that contribute to domestic violence. But if it is severe, it is very recent, or it is ongoing, um, and we think either of the partners are in danger, then no, we don't put them in the same groups. We do offer them resources. And we offer them other kinds of resources and programs that would better fit where they are right right then. <clears throat> and ref referrals to the community agencies that would take that on directly. And then once they have taken that issue on directly, they're invited to return and apply again to be in the groups. So it's it's a uh, it's a process. It's a continuum. It's a um, if it's happening in a family, you know the rule throughout SFI is safety first, safety first, safety first. And I'm sure Armando runs his, has had a lot of experience running that. Maybe Armando, did you want to say something briefly about that? Yeah, I mean, as you described, we have a similar a, a process like that where we really assess if um, a couple can be together, uh, if they have domestic violence, uh, history of domestic violence in the home. Um, and uh, and it, it is very, um, um, you know, it can be very powerful in changing, uh, in changing people's attitudes. Uh, as they go through the program, and and, and as as you know, uh, Marsha was saying that the 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 per, the, the classes that involve uh, co-parents, both uh, the the mother and the father, uh, they report a much uh, you know stronger change in their relationship. Um, but for that to as, as they were saying, for that to happen. Uh, they have to be ready. They have to be at a point that they both want to work on and, and both see the value of working with that uh, and working with the relationship. Okay. Thank you, Armando. There, there are a number of other questions about domestic violence and um, court-involved families. We'll um, hold on to these and come back to these um, after we've uh, finished the, our um, quote unquote formal presentation. There are also a number about where do you get this and how do you do this and who can do it, which we'll also come back to um, af at, at the top of the hour. Um, but for now, let's go back to um, the Pruitts. Can we have the next slide? Yeah, we can keep going. I think we addressed that. We did we've done a lot of research to see why the groups and many of you work in groups and don't need any um, any further proof that they are powerful and in fact we've always loved groups and groups used to be used a lot more they stopped being used so much in the u.s partially because insurance stopped paying as much for groups but these six things in your slide are the reasons that we believe in groups because they do provide information, not from the group leaders, but from each other. They normalize experiences. Some of the funniest moments are like when uh, somebody says, I thought my partner was a real jerk, but after hearing you talk, I think I have it pretty good. Um, <laughs> they recognize family patterns. They learn to really be together in this. Many of our <laughs> groups go on to exchange phone numbers and emails and to work together either in like a babysitting collective or just to continue meeting and they provide a sort of pure base for the couple. It is the reason that 
couples open up because there are other men doing it. There are other women doing it. Nobody is on their own. I wanted to simply clarify, you know, there's a shadow over this <laughs> slide cast by the skill of the group leaders. There are, there's a man and a woman running this group together. They generally have master's level or above experience. They're clinicians. They work together as a couple and they role model co-parenting in the delivery of the curriculum. And so the domestic violence question doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes up in a conversation when you're being screened. It comes up in a group. If we didn't think it existed in a family. A family gets into a group and suddenly it's revealed that it's been happening. The group leaders work together with the group to handle that. They may refer them out. They may pull them out of the group. They have a separate meeting with them. So we, we were asked by the state of California to provide this with some of their most complex and difficult families, the families that had already been reported for domestic violence or for uh, child protection uh, services. And this turned out to be as effective with them as it was for the families who were at much lower risk. Next slide, please. Ready to go? Yeah. One of the things we want to emphasize is that the kinds of findings that we found, which is depression went down, anxiety went down, parenting stress went down, the children's behavior stayed stable next to a control group where it got worse, um, the couple's harsh parenting went down, violent problem solving strategies went down, collaborative problem solving stayed about the same or went up. But we did this so it was a randomized control group and we've now had many, many trials. And so two of them have been done as randomized control. One what's called a benchmark design. Um, I know this was just done with a comparison group with women who are in their pregnancy um, in Malta. Um, this is being done in Israel with another group. It's been done in a number of ways, but our group showed that all these changes held for 18 months. And in fact, we, had, we didn't have enough funding actually to do all of them, but for a number of them, we were able to follow them two and a half years later and, it, and our findings held. And that's very unusual. It's one of the only studies, in fact, that does show these long-term longitudinal results with very controlled studies. And we believe that's because hopefully the quality of the program, also the way it's run. There's a meal at every intervention night. There is childcare provided when there's needed. It's really holistic. Um, we've done it in a small place in Massachusetts where they paid for cab rides for families to get there in another um, county in California. Somebody went and picked up all the parents. So there's a number of ways this works, but it really focuses on supporting all the aspects that make a difference to parents. And we think that's partly why it holds. So before we get to one of the last slides, <clears throat> this summarizes a lot of what SFI really has brought to us. I wanted to give Armando a chance I know we're not supposed to play favorites, but we almost have one, we always have one or two favorite families. Um, and I wonder if you could pick one and describe it briefly uh, to the folks on the webinar. Sorry about that, it took me a while to get the mute button off. Um, yeah, the, uh, I mean, one family that really stuck to me um, was it's a and, and this this is interesting enough even though I know that this as we've mentioned uh, most of the changes that are that are stronger changes with with co-parents are when they are, are in uh, groups that are with the mother and the father uh, this is a particular family where it was the father he was coming to the father's only group um, and uh, but it's uh it, it, it was he was somebody he was kind of like a youngish father he was like in his uh, uh mid twenties um and he came to the group full of complaints uh about his his co parent and they they had separated recently so this is a this is something i don't know if we've emphasized enough i mean some of the some of the uh, couples that come 
sometimes they're not romantically involved. They're just, they are co-parents uh, where they're raising their kids together, but they're not in a relationship anymore. Um, and in his case, he came in with a lot, all these complaints about her, but all the things that he was, she was doing to, you know, make his life impossible. And uh, when he realized, um, when he really, he really got the message, it was about improving relationship and, and relationship and how would that benefit his children. Um, and the, the change was so uh, impressive that, that in, like in the, he, he managed to recreate, to reconstruct trust in his relationship with his co-parent. So I, we could see how she turned from an enemy to an ally for him. And, uh, and, and, and still he was able to maintain his boundary because he didn't want to go, go back and, and into that relationship. But um, it, it came to a point that where she, he was helping him in, in, you know, to fix all the, the, the issues that he was having in court. Some of those issues were started because uh, when they were in a conflict together, uh, um, she had, you know, come up with a started court proceedings against him. And she, she helped him resolve, resolve them later because he really made a priority of supporting her. Um, and, uh, and she really started to understand that, uh, according to his words, we, we actually uh, didn't get to, you know, the way our program works is not a program, it's not a, we're not, uh, it's not a research program at this point. So we weren't, we're not able to follow every family member's perspective, but, um, you know, he was coming back with glowing reports about his relationship. And so that, that was one of my favorite families in the sense of uh, the change and transformation that I saw when he came to understand that it was about that relationship, how much of an impact that would have on his children. And uh, so that's, that, that is one that really sticks to my mind. It must have had quite an impact on the other people in the group to watch yeah. you achieve that to Armando. Great, thank you for that. Um, last slide. So in summary, what happened? Where did we get? <clears throat> Was it worth the candle for the state of California and the money they spend on this? And I think uh, the bullet points on this, it's a resounding yes. Um, statistically significant and lasting reductions across many risk factors for abuse and neglect in parents and partners compared to controls. And I wanna emphasize again, we're not just talking about biological fathers here. We're talking about fathering partners who may turn out to be um, whoever's supporting the mother in her job uh, as trying to raise the children the best she can. And, some, and it has been done in some same-sex couples. We also have had mothers who brought their brothers or their uncles or even their own fathers into the group who were because they were so involved. And these results hold for those groups. Those are not outliers. Child outcomes favored better behavior, school readiness, reductions in aggressive problem solving compared to controls. The kinds of things the parents learned to do in co-parenting showed up in less aggression in their children. And we have, we have independent measures of that as these children were old enough to start entering group care. Personal growth among many practitioners it was not just the families that moved and changed in their needles, so did the practitioners. Many of them returned to upgrade their education and their status as professionals. One of our favorite stories is a case manager who eventually went through master's degree, PhD, and wound up as the mayor of her town. And um, nobody in her family had ever right. um, gotten higher education before. Right. And she just kept going. She said, I watched these people change and I figured maybe I've got something to learn from them. And finally, the agencies where the practitioners worked became more father friendly, were recognized by their communities as more welcoming, going beyond the mother child approaches to include fathers and co parenting. One of the programs we worked with was a, was a WIC program. And the WIC program, of course, has some paternal engagement. They want, um, uh, they, they're hoping that feeding will be supported, but they're not an actively father recruiting uh, agency until they got involved with SFI and they became one. Uh, so despite their name, uh, they were seen in the community as father supporting. Um, I wanna ask Andromanda one more question before we go back to Josh. How did this 
How did you see your agency change, um, Armando, through the SFI um, offerings? Well, um, the, the, the agency that Papas is part of, uh, first of all, is a, a, um, it, it, it encompasses also um, Head Start. Um, and uh, I, I wasn't part of the program when the program first started. Um, I do know that there was a, a lot of change in, the, in how Head Start worked with fathers um, um, because from before, because the, they, they didn't have that information. And, and what I've noticed also is that often uh, agencies, uh, you know, Head Start or other agencies, they're, they always are trying to involve the father uh, because they do see that difference that I was seeing when I was, when I was uh, working with communication and families. Uh, they, they, they get much more participation from mothers. And uh, what happens is it becomes this loop where uh, you, you, you start getting, um, you start kind of looking to engage the mother because you start thinking from the perspective of the provider that that's, that's the person that is going, uh, that's the person that is going to be more involved uh, and that is actually going to engage in the services. But uh, with, this, with this program, uh, it was about engaging the father. And so uh, a lot of the, changes that I, I, I think happen in, in Head Start as from before and after is that they started changing. Um, uh, they're starting to becoming more conscious of being welcoming to fathers in the agency. Uh, even from posters that they put in the families, they, they made sure to include fathers in posters, like, like you know, things like that, like when they would come to the office. Um, it, it was, it, they also made, take much more care also to involve we work in, a, in partnership with them, so they, they took more care also to involve our program uh, uh, to reach out to the father too, uh, to have another, you know, more support in that way. Um, and, and, and it's kind of, it was kind of like a change in mentality in, the, in that sense. Uh, I, I do have to say it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that needs to be maintained uh, because it's very easy for an, for an agency such as Head Start uh, it, again, like we tend to go through what is easier, uh, and it's, it tends to be easier to engage the mother. So, once if the if the if if the constant dialogue is not there, it's very easy to revert back to. That's a crucial time. point. We found that too, Armando. That some agencies changed a little bit right away, and then they sank back. Then you had to kind of go back and do it. Yeah. Thank you, Armando. Uh, our last contribution before I hand it back to Josh is a brief four minute video that we're gonna show you of a father in one of the father-child activity um, sessions who is reading to his child. And this turned out to be one of the favorite things for these men, uh, many of whom didn't have a whole heck of a lot of schooling to be sharing with their children. So we'll look at the video. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, I just want to let everybody know that um, we will be here after the top of the hour. So we're going to formally wrap up with this beautiful video clip, but stay with us afterwards because Kyle is gonna tell us um, something that may um, be surprising for um, some of us about uh, what's going on in this video. And then at the top of the hour, we will stay here. We've got more videos for you. And there are lots of really great questions, some about the research, uh, some about more about specific challenges with uh, fathers and families, and more about how, how you can get this and um, how you can um, do this, uh, this work, and in particular, uh, the SFI uh, program. So we will do what we can to get your questions after the top of the hour. And uh, those uh, questions may also be addressed in the two remaining webinars that we hope you'll come back for. There's one at the same time on Tuesday, October 20th, where we'll be focusing on the voices of children, fathers, and mothers regarding the importance of fathering and co-parenting. So that's October 20th. And then um, on November 17th, we'll be back with our last one, uh, which we're calling from second shift to first shift, which is really about supporting fathers as central to family life. So uh, watch with us now this really beautiful video clip and stay with us so you can hear more about it from Kyle 
uh, for those of you who can't stay with us after the top of the hour. Froggy, Froggy, where you at, Froggy? Froggy. Uh, and Sleepy say, Froggy, where you at? Froggy, Froggy. Uh huh. The Froggy, they're looking for the frog. Yeah. And then they're looking in a hole for the frog. They still can't find it. In the hole right here. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And they see a beehive. Yeah, and and then they got scared. They go, oh, oh, the bees are coming out. Yeah, yeah, the bees are coming out. And then Sleepy, the little dog, sees the bees. But then the frog is right there. Yes. And the little boy goes up to the tree, and he's looking for it in the tree. I saw a tree. Yeah, the tree. And the owl comes out of the tree. Hey, what are you looking for? And then Sleepy the dog is running away from the bees. Yes. And they're still looking for the frog. They're looking for the frog under the rocks and they can't find it. And he stands up on top of the rug, Froggy, Froggy. Froggy, sorry. Yeah. He says, Froggy, Froggy, where are you? Froggy, run in the rock. And he finds a big moose. It's a moose, a, a wolf. And he asks the moose, have you seen little Froggy? A wolf, a wolf, a Froggy. Yes. And the moose says, no, but I'll help you look. Mm -hmm. They're looking for Froggy. Yes. So you're watching um, a wonderfully contingent reciprocal form of communication. Uh, you may be surprised to know that the father was not literate. And there were no words in these pages. These are the McGinney readers, McGuffey readers, I can't remember what they're called, but they're used in um, a lot of early education because they don't have, um, there, there's no printed words on them, so you have to lead by the action. And so this father and his son are figuring out what's happening between the two of them. And the father rated this the high point of his entire SFI experience, that he was able to read to his son something his father had never done with him. And I think it is an example of the profound change. You can write a curriculum, you can design it any way you want, but you are not gonna know what moves people's hearts um, and, and unless you stick with them, see them through and support them throughout the entire process of the investigation of what it is that means to be a good co-parent. And that was part of the joy of the program. And this dad actually cried after this and said that he was no longer so afraid of getting involved. He had never wanted to read before because he didn't want his child to, to know that he couldn't read. And now he realized how much he had to give. It was quite, quite lovely to be a part of. Thank you so much, um, Marsha Pruitt, Kyle Pruitt, and Armand Alcaraz. Um, there were so many comments in the chat about um, how much um, we all loved uh, seeing this father with his little boy. And I was just thinking if we ever needed a reminder about why we were drawn to this work and why it sustains us, um, these just these few minutes with this father and son are, um, are, are sure important. Uh, we, um, we can't thank you enough for your generosity in bringing to us uh, your program and your experience. And we're really thrilled that you'll um, continue on with us with your colleagues, uh, Phil and Carolyn Cowan, um, in our next webinar. And I'd like to thank um, everybody who's joined us from all over the country and many places um, outside of this country around the world for uh, today's uh, webinar. And uh, we will um, stick around for those of you who can stay with more of your questions and some more uh, videos. So uh, please, um, come back for 
Parent and Child Voices, The Importance of Father and Co-Parenting on Tuesday, October 20th. And um, we've got more webinars for you. Um, you can go to our website to register for them and to get the dates, engaging families with a strength-based approach in our virtual world. And some of you actually had questions about that. That one's uh, coming up soon, Thursday, October 8th. And then we've got more. Um, our Learning to Listen series, which Kyle Pruitt appeared in about a year ago, and you can see that on our website. It's recorded, and today's will be recorded for those of you who are wondering. Uh, but on October 14th, we will have transgender right advocates, Johanna Olson and Amy Elton Kenny, talking about children's gender identity and um, uh, transgender um, parents. Wednesday, October 28th, 28th, we'll have Mayra Alvarez, CEO of the Children's Partnership, who'll be talking about current immigration policies and their harmful effects on children and families and what we can all do to uh, fight back and support those families. And then on November, November, November 18th, Hassan Daniel, who's uh, founder of the Father Factory, will be talking with us about fathers with childhood histories of sexual abuse and how he wouldn't use the word heal, but how um, about his work with them to um, be the fathers they want to be. Um, and uh, for themselves and for their families. So uh, again, you can find all these on, on the browsingtouchpoints.org website, go to the webinar um, tab. Uh, and then there, there's Supporting Everyone's Mental Health. It's a three-part series, October 19th, 26th, and November uh, 2nd. And this is uh, really something that we've um, put together for all of us who are just struggling through this um, quadruple pandemic that we're uh, in right now. And um, I'm thinking about uh, coronavirus. I'm thinking about economic collapse, uh, the, the great but way too late white awakening to racism and um, climate change. And we might throw a fifth one in there, which is the upcoming election. So um, uh, that's uh, for all of you as well. Um, uh, so again, go to our website uh, to take a look, find out more, and um, find out how to join us. Josh, can I just let people know, since I know many people have to leave, that um, if you're interested in more about supporting father involvement, you do see the um, supporting father involvement sfi.org. But more importantly, they can contact Josh through the Brazelton Touchpoint Center and let him know that you're interested, and he'll give you more information. We are trying to put together ways of bringing the program um, to virtually and through to large audiences across the country, as well as to individual groups that we go to in different states. But we'd be, um, we're working together with the Touchpoint Center on that. So reach out and we'll get back to you. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we are going to continue on now with some questions that I think are related to um, what you've just said, Marcia. There are a number of questions about um, where to go and how to do this. And um, uh, one of them is, um, uh, is there anything we could take with us to study and remember this information? Um, resources that people can find uh, on your website or, or download, things that uh, we can share on our website if you share them with us. Sure. I mean, there are several articles written that describe the program and describe the culture adaptations we made, um, both from our in program in England, from Canada, as well as from the U.S. So you can um, find those on our website, which is in bad need of updating. Um, we are, you know, this is something we're really involved in, but it's not something like we sell. We give it to people. We ask that you get trained in it so that you can um, do it with consistency and with fidelity to the model. But other than that, um, our goal is just to help people enjoy it and use it. And we can offer consultation if needed, but um, you can get all that information on the website or again, through Josh, if there are things you can't find and, and we'll help you find them while we get ourselves back up to speed. You can also um, look at my website, Marsha Klein Pruitt, um, and you'll find it on Smith College's website. Kyle has, has one, Phil and Carolyn also. Um, so though we have resources of different kinds on different websites and 
we're happy to try and put you together with what you really want. Could you, could yeah. you put a couple of those into the chat, Marsha? Uh, um, okay, great. Um, and so while you're doing that, a few more questions. Um, uh, the name of the curriculum is Supporting Father Involvement. Yes. Uh, the name of the website is SFI. Supporting Father Involvement, SFI.org. It was on our last slide. Yeah. And we could go back to that one maybe, um, uh, Autumn or uh, Kayla, if you could help us with that. And one question was, can you use this uh, in one-on-one -on -one home visiting uh, settings with children ages um, birth through five? Can you use it? Absolutely. It's, um, it was actually started, the whole model started with pregnant parents. Um, Kyle mentioned that most of the children were two. They didn't have to be two, but the average age was 2.3, two years and three months that most people come and want to be part of this program. Um, and as I mentioned, we have a form of it that we're doing through UMass. Um, and uh, Rachel Herman, who's a doc student, was the primary researcher for that, but we started it in the second trimester. And we actually have data that shows that we can reduce stress through cortisol um, for moms in particular and babies. The dads had less change in that program um, for various reasons. But that one was really done more as a, a combination of a birthing program and parts of SFI and other things. We are in the process of putting some finishing touches on the virtual SFI experience of Josh and a home visiting program uh, that wanted to use some of the SF, that wanted to use SFI would be greatly assisted by its existence as a virtual entity uh, because you could have group experiences on in a gallery on your screen rather than having to be physically present and um, people have begun to in, use SFI virtually um, Armando's group was one of the first to try to move on to a virtual curriculum and, and they gave us some really important experience. So don't worry so much about your structure fitting SFI structure. Uh, but the, the heart of SFI are the changes that you can bring about when you increase your vision to include the father in a positive way. Um, and as Armando said, he's not doing research anymore. He's following what Jack Shonkoff has been yelling at us for doing. He said, you know, there's no point creating more and more science that says more and more to the same people. You've got to get changing uh, what we do with what we already know. And that's where that is. That's where Amanda's doing. Thank you, Kyle. So um, you, you began, Marcia, to talk about the ages of the children. There was a question about why two years. And I think what you said is that um, it's actually been a broader range than that, including beginning in pregnancy, um, but that in some of your studies that ended up being the average age, but it's not that that is necessarily a requirement yeah. or a focus of yours in particular. Is that, is that right? That is correct. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, a, a, a number of other um, questions uh, about um, uh, research. Phil Cowan, your um, partner, suggested that you um, talk more about um, the evidence regarding couples where domestic violence is involved. And before you jump into that, I, I just wanted to note, and this comes from what you were just saying, Kyle, a number of, of uh, folks in the chat talked about the different uh, father involvement programs that they use. And some of them noted that they um, get you know, lots of participation from fathers. So, you know, I thought as you talk about the research regarding domestic violence and other research, if you also could, uh, you know, maybe go back over or add to what you said about what's unique and different about this program, um, both in terms of what it, it's aiming to do and the kinds of outcomes that um, it's been able to uh, achieve and, and measure. <clears throat> well, I'll take the second one first while Marcia's thinking about the answer um, <laughs> to the first question. Um, unique childhood outcomes, the mean age of the index child, the emphasis 
on co-parenting, not simply fathering. And the use of group experiences to maximize strengths and to minimize weaknesses. Um, I think those are the unique components. I can't think of anybody else who's put all of that together. And also that we have, um, they'll actually uh, help lead a, the conducting of a, a path model that actually shows how this works. And it shows that really focusing on the co-parenting relationship gives you a much bigger bang for your buck, that it changes each parent's relationships with their children in a positive way, and that affects children's outcomes. So we have done so many programs look at parenting, but don't focus adequately on the co-parenting. And yet we know that the co-parenting comes before. That is, it can impact the parenting as opposed to the other way around. It's been just like fathers are sort of the, the neglected part of families for years, co-parenting, whether parents are living together or not, although it is far more powerful, I think, when they are living together, it, uh, it really is the missing element that we know much less about. But once you start strengthening it, it flows into all the other family, family pieces. Uh, and an addendum to Marcia's answer, um, I think what we have changed or we have, what we have tried to bring to the light, Josh, has been the tyranny of low expectations around father inclusion. Uh, we have, quote, let them get away from us for years, partly because we weren't looking for them, we were not actively engaging with them and specifically asking them to be part of our intervention. And there, that is one of the differences between, mothers just assume that because they're the mother of the child, you're gonna be interested in them. Fathers don't. And so if you want a dad to be engaged, you have to reach out and explicitly invite him. Everything from their artwork in your waiting room to the fact that when he doesn't show up, you, you consider whether or not you should go ahead and meet with a mother because it was supposed to be a couple's meeting. If you go ahead with that meeting, you just undermined yourself as a positive father engager. And you've, I'm not advising you always do that, but I want you to be thinking about the tyranny of low expectations and how it affects us every time we make a decision about an interaction with a mom and a dad. Two other things I, I think are important to note that are reasons why we love this program. One is we actually assess the change in organizations towards father friendliness and family friendliness. And we believe that you can't just keep dealing with individual families. You have to change the organizations that deal with so many families. And this one has a whole piece where you learn to both assess, follow, consult about the changing of the organization. So that's another piece that is um, pretty unique. And the last thing I wanted to say is, I wouldn't say it's the only program, but it, there aren't that many that have actually done the research to show that it is equally effective with black families, with Latinx families with white families and has also um, been embraced by Native American families in different um, groups, in different bands, and also with a number of different kind of religions and with different gender orientations. So that's the other thing that's really neat about this program. Right now it's um, been experimented with, with um, Asian families, particularly Chinese families, and it's also Although we haven't done a randomized control study, it's turned out to be very accepting and um, popular. So it, because it doesn't prescribe, it simply helps focus and lift and buffer. Um, it really has been widely accepted and widely used and widely um, successful. And you don't have to make a lot of changes because it isn't really rooted in the kind of white culture that so many parenting programs are. Um, thank you, um, Marcia and Kyle. You know, uh, someone else asked about how this was aligned with the touch points approach. And I think um, there are many ways in which it is. One is that it's strength-based and it's um, positively focused. It's also focused on 
systems and relationships. And, and that's, I think, one of the things that's, you know, hard for people to understand about the difference here, which is, you, you know, you call it supporting father involvement, but your focus is really on, on the parenting partnership and on the relationship to a very great extent. And so often when people have fathers in their head, they think about the individual father and not about the relationship. And that again is very much um, a part of the touch points work is thinking about systems, family systems, and the systems, and that the, fo the focus that um, we're taking is on, on the interaction on the relationship. But the other thing that you said, Marcia, is I think one of the reasons why both um, your work and the touch points approach has been um, really uh, widely not only accepted, but really valued uh, is because it's not prescriptive. It's not top down. It's not a cookie cutter protocol where, you know, you've got the, you know, white people from Ivory Tower coming in and telling you how you should do things. It, it's, it's really more facilitative for the emergence of the, the wisdom that's already there with lots of opportunities for, um, uh, for co-creation uh, and adaptation. I, um, I, I want to, um, uh, to turn to a couple of your video clips um, so that uh, we we can um, end at the half hour with um, uh, some more comments on those uh, perhaps from those who are stayed with us and um, uh, we still got more than 800 people with us um, and um, uh, from you so um, I don't know if it's Kayla or Kayla I think you're um, running the video if you can just start us off at the top of the video we'll we'll look at um the clips that we haven't shown yet tape we are going to actually have to sign off so the tapes will speak for themselves all right okay <laughs> thank you okay bye kyle bye marcia thank you What changes did you notice in yourself? Well, predominantly I found that I had a tremendous more patience. Um, being single for 34 years and being married much later than most of the people that were in uh, my particular class, I found that the selfishness that you have as a single person needs to be set aside so that you are able to have the patience to deal with all of the issues that come with everyday life, with children and your wife. <clears throat> and I found that uh, father involvement gave me many more tools to be able to deal with the situations that arise in everyday life. We practiced each one of those um, in class through the 16 weeks. Uh, that just was reinforced over and over again. And again, each week it seemed to give us another uh, method to communicate and to deal with the everyday issues that, again, come with family life. What changes did you notice in your partner? I found that she was much more open to hear my point of view. I found that she was uh, much more available to me and my children that she was able to look at situations from a different vantage point and a different point of view. I think being able to see other parents with children of the same age, dealing with the same issues and dealing with them in their own ways gave us perspective as to <clears throat> some of the positive things that we were doing with our children and some of the things that we maybe wanted to modify and to uh, adapt with um, the structure that the class gave us. And it was very, very um, beneficial to, to our family unit. <clears throat> what was helpful about your connection with your case manager? Well, my case manager was available to us just at all times and really tried to reinforce that father involvement was much more beyond the 16 weeks that we were going to have um, classes and instruction on a, on a daily basis. But that father involvement was going to give us a broad range of resources if the need arose for us to deal with marital issues, with family issues, with um, educational issues with our children. And it just gave us a, 
a really uh, good feeling that we had that support that really went beyond our class, our classroom instruction. Uh, my name is Gerardo Castellan. I'm from uh, Lindsay, California. Um, I didn't know what to expect from this program, and, uh, and I had a lot of doubts to going because I know it's like it was a a program for fathers, and it's not common to see stuff like that. And uh, I wanted to see what it was about, so I was introduced to that program from uh, my daughter's teacher, what she told me about. And she recommended it because uh, I guess she knew what the situation was with uh, my marriage, and uh, and I I took her advice and I came in and checked out the program. What was your situation with your marriage at the time? Uh, at the time, uh, my marriage was pretty rocky. Was, um, me and my wife weren't getting along at the time, and our our communication was really broken down. And I can see that I was speaking to my kids. And I figured, if, I mean, if this was for the, I mean, being a father, and and if, if, if they were able to help my children out, I think um, I should have taken to the program, and maybe it could help my marriage as well. I need to really concentrate on my kids, not just on the problem that I was in, because what sometimes what you feel is what they're feeling, and and I think this program really helped me to really think about the kids before any other problem. So, what did the problem lead to? What was the conclusion to the problem? Um, the problem led to that I'm divorced now, and and I have custody of my kids, and you know uh, the situation I think gotten better because that we're divorced now. It's not the situation that I wanted to 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 end it in with, but the the situation wasn't resolving, and the problem was still there. So I took action of um, getting a divorce and getting custody of my kids and so I can protect my kids from any harm to them or any situation I want them to be in or to see. Okay. So where are your kids, what would you say your kids' situation is right now? Uh, my kids' situations, um, Polly, a little confused still, um, but I think you know, going through this program, I can just gradually show them what's going on and don't drop the whole the whole problem on them or to know that their parents are divorced or, you know, I think this program helped me is to really focus on what they're doing and not just the problem that we're in or the problem that we have or that we have a, a family that is split apart. But I think gradually showing them what's going on, I think it's helping them out. These are with me, I show them that I care about them and take care of them, and they, I think they really see that. And, and I think what they learn from me, I think, is if I show them that I care and I love them, I think it's going to grow on them. And whenever they become a parent, I think they're going to be a good parents. Is there, um, is there something you could say to all those fathers, um, a recommendation or anything? Um, and if you guys really care about your kids and, and you guys are in a bad situation, uh, I don't know if on your, your behalf or your spouse's behalf, you know, you really need to take a look at your kids because what your kids see is, is what they're going to do. And I really encourage you guys to be a good father because it's not going to affect you, it's not going to affect your kids, but it's going to affect generations. And, Sometimes, if we don't catch that on time, and that chain is going to keep on growing and growing, and it might affect your grandchildren. So I, I really encourage you guys to really focus on what you guys are doing around your kids, because it's, it's going to affect them. I think the biggest change um, that I saw in him was he's, he's spending more time with the children. He's doing more of the day-to-day -day routine activities, like. Um, taking the kids a bath and reading stories with them. And I see a huge difference in the children. I think it's been um, a tremendous change in them. I mean, I see their confidence. I see them really growing closer to him. So I think that that is the biggest change that I've seen in him. With Jennifer, I really feel like her communication with me and how we 
um, address issues with the children has been a critical point for us in our relationship. <clears throat> it always used to be a sticking point as far as discipline and structure for the children. And I found that I was on the right and she was more on the left. And now what we found is that by discussing these issues, um, sometimes she's right and sometimes I'm right. And we agree to that each one of those issues is going to be addressed individually and that they're not just heaped into one big lump sum. And it's really helped our relationship together. It's froggy, froggy, where you at, froggy? Thank froggy. you, Kayla. If we can and sleepy say froggy. I would love to see this one again. <laughs> um, but we are going to stop in a couple of minutes for real. Um, I think um, Kyle and Marsha are right that um, those videos that uh, come from uh, Santa Cruz um, do say it all. I want to be sure um, to thank our fabulous interpreter, Maria Jose Gutierrez, um, for um, uh, interpreting for us all the way through. And I'm wondering, Armando, if um, you have some um, closing thoughts about what we've done today and in particular about the um, videos that we just watched before we do say goodbye. Yeah, I was, well, thank you. Thank you for, so much for putting this, this on and, and, uh, and, you know, I think, I think some final thoughts is that there's so much more to tell. I could see, I took a look, brief look at so many questions that, uh, you know, you could have like a whole hour just talking about some of those. Uh, a lot of those, uh, you know, around the, were about, you know, the difficulty of engaging fathers and how exactly do we do that. And, and it's, it's definitely varies. And so it's, it, it, it does take a lot to, you know, to delve deep, more deeply into that. And, uh, and, you know, like it was really, it was really great to having uh, both Marsha and Kyle, uh, just to, you know, explain how the program came into being and, and, and what the program is about and, and, uh, and how it differs, differs from others, other approaches. Um, the videos really, I mean, those videos were from, were made, I believe a few, like several years ago, uh, from the, from the research that happened in this area. And, uh, and we still see very similar, um, uh, changes in people that go through the videos. Um, and so it's that, you know, just keeps happening. Uh, and, and, and the reason I think it is this unique approach, um, of, of the, the groups are more like guides, they're guiding, uh, they're, they're more like they're, it, the, the content uh, is brought by the participants and something that we have in our groups where we say, we are all, all of us are teachers and all of us are students. And, and that's part of how the fathers then to learn to value what they bring because it's valued in that group and, uh, and they can see how much it matters to everybody else. And we value the experiences of the participants as much uh, more than the, you know, than what we, what we might bring ourselves as facilitators uh, because we're, we're really, really spotlighting and highlighting uh, and giving them information that is relevant uh, for them to, to talk and discuss and understand. And so I'm really grateful to be able to share, share a little bit of, of this. And as I said, uh, there's so much more that we could talk about. And I think that I believe there's going to be another, another uh, webinar that maybe there's be more, more opportunity to address some of these questions. Right. Yes. We um, will see you again on October 20th with uh, Marsha and Kyle's colleagues, Phil and Carolyn Cowan. And I, I just loved what you said about we all are teachers and learners and that it helps uh, fathers value what they already know and what they bring and what their children have taught them. And that is um, um, really a, another important way in which uh, this work is so closely aligned with the touch points of approach. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, I have um, saved all of your questions and hopefully we can come back to them and you'll bring us more on October 20th. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much, Armando. And thank you, Maria Jose, Autumn, Strasbourg, and Kayla Savelli for making this all happen. Bye, everybody.